because I, I notice I point out books constantly. Well, why would you read a book when you could just Google up the answer to everything? That's a good question. Although I there, did I did I tell you about um, the Flynn effect? I think I'm pretty sure I mentioned it. Well, it's like the more knowledge, the less people look it up. No, the Flynn effect is um, called that because of uh, James Flynn, and he didn't name it that, even though he was the one that, that uh, realized it. It was called the, the Flynn effect by Charles Murray, who uses Flynn's data uh, in things like his books you know, and so on. But um, the Flynn effect is that each new cohort group of youth right, uh, are, have higher IQs measurably than the previous cohort. It's a statistical thing, so it doesn't mean a specific individual, of course, but when you look at the testing, the newest cohort uh, um, takes tests that demonstrate that their IQs are higher than the previous one. The, the, but the way of recognizing that is complicated, of course, for several different reasons. One is the tests are changed. Well, doesn't IQ always yeah. gradually increase? It does. Well, it has been. And then they got to redo the test and then yes. reset it up. Yes, yes. But the question, of course, was, well, why was that the case? Right. Um, but then, then uh, the other flip side of this, though, is that knowledge, the knowledge base, it has decreased. So while each new cohort tends to be have a faster working problem solving brain, they actually know less. I know everything because I have it on my computer. Well, and, and that's part of the, the problem, but the thing is if you're, you're a computer and you're trying to solve a problem, the information that you're working with has to be already in the computer. It's not like the solution will, now you might be able to come up with this, and that is how do you enter phase your brain with Google or something in order to solve a problem that you don't know all the information about, that, that might eventually happen. But the, the traditional way of getting that kind of information into the head is by reading books. And we have alternate ways of doing it now, but the thing is, even when you like watch the video of, you know, Bethany Yu is talking about Nietzsche, the BBC, Hopefully you had a chance to see that because it seems like now that I've assigned that, somebody deleted it and now you can't you can't pull it up. At least I, I couldn't this morning. Did you watch it last night? No. Oh, schade. Which is German for shame. It's a shame. Not, it's a shame. You're ashamed, but it's a shame that you couldn't get to see it. But bless you. It's really, really good. She really does a great job. I'm, I'm a real fan of hers. And not cause, just because she's sexy, which is also sort of the case. Um, however, uh, so, so there's an interesting question about how you can learn stuff from your visual cortex is definitely a powerful way. Remember the Mufasa, you know, how did Mufasa buy a question? Uh, you did Mufasa, right? But, I mean, you remember the visual stuff, but a book is very different. And if you're reading it, it's, it's interesting because you have to construct in your mind the visual interaction that you're depicting in your visual cortex. So, so if I'm reading a novel, I'm imagining the characters. I'm, you know, so Harry Potter, you read Harry Potter books, then you watch the movie, most people will say that they were disappointed in the movie. How did that happen? How were they disappointed? They, they imagined it in a way that to them was better than what it turned out to be on the screen. And of course, the screen is like a two hour, two and a half hour thing. If you read a book, you're looking at what? At least 18? Semester, 24? an entire semester. Well, you could you could read a Harry Potter novel in a day and a half, two days. It's not long. You just sit there and read like all day. Pretty much. You have to eat. 
you have to, well, you don't have to sleep, actually. I know about the not sleeping sleep. part. I, um, I've gone a couple days without sleep. It's brutal. Everybody, um, excuse my pajamas and my rubbish hair and no makeup. I know it's like half one, but I only got up a little while ago. Um, this is my Gecky Hallows vlog that I have been looking forward to and dreading for a very long time. Now, if you want to stop here because there are spoilers, don't watch if you haven't read it because there are going to be spoilers. Okay, basically. It was the most incredible, amazing, perfect, amazing, incredible, wonderful book I've ever read in my life. I've like never cried so much reading a book. It was so, so sad, but so, so happy. And I was really... So, she made this, obviously, early or whatever right after she had finished reading the seventh book. And she explains in this that, because I've listened to the whole thing, I think it's absolutely fantastic for scholarly purposes to see how young people reacted to the Henry Potter books. Um, she read it in about a day and a half. In fact, a lot of the time she was reading it in the car while her parents were driving back from London, where they, they went and bought the book. Right, so, so she was just constantly reading it. Yes, that brutal. But, but like, yeah, you actually sit in a chair with the book. You can have. I usually listen to music uh, in the background if I have it. Uh, you do. It's a good idea for you to get up every so often because otherwise your butt freezes into the chair or, or whatever. Um, do I have that on even? Um, yeah, they say you should move at least like every 45 minutes or something because it's bad for you to just sit all the time. Um, the same thing at, at work and stuff. That's why they're remodeling workstations and so on, having people stand or do other things. Right? Um, but yeah, you actually sit and read for hours at a time with some breaks for like moving and stuff like that. But so basically, you, you actually concentrate on reading a book for pages. Uh, of course, some books read faster than others. Harry Potter, you fin finish a, a novel like that in a, you know a day and a half, or so. and, and I'm saying that because some of those are really you know large, right? Um, other books like philosophy books tend to take much longer uh, because. Um, you're thinking about what's going on. With, with like a novel, you're just constructing the events as, as you go. But with a, a book where someone like Nietzsche is arguing uh, about you know, what, it, what the impact of, of the death of God will mean on society, right? Um, and what does he mean by that? You're, I mean, you, you have to get you know, Zarathustra coming down from the hill, et cetera. You know what's what's going on uh, um, in your mind is is you're 
not just constructing a, a visual image of events happening, but you're rearranging your neural network as you're listening to this argument. You're, you're kind of weighing their, their uh, premises. You know, you're trying to see if those lead to the conclusions that they make and so on. You know, so you can decide whether you like this argument, or whether you're going to believe it, you know, if it's going to impact your thinking, etc. So you're doing all this kind of mental reevaluation. So sometimes like you'll read something and you won't continue on right away reading the next paragraph. You'll pause and think about that for a minute. Right? So so reading in that sense, if you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend doing it. We uh, years ago uh, one of the the chancellors uh, came, no, it was the president of the university, actually, came in and he was talking with a group of students and some of us, and, and he was confused about why students were having such a hard time, especially, especially uh, uh, first year students, uh, because so many, uh, upwards of 40, 45, 50 percent of our first term students don't come back. Can't, can't get anything out of the coursework. And he says, why is that? And my answer was, well, unless people have their parents read to them as children, and they've graduated from one level of reading to the next, so by the time they get to college, they're actually reading college material, then they're not going to be able to do the course materials as we expect. Right? Well, the, the thing that I've learned from visiting villages and things is that most people in Alaska don't read, don't read books. And even though we might say that most people are literate in the United States, what they actually are measuring is not the quality of literacy that they have. In fact, it seems like most people in the U.S. that are literate are only literate to about a sixth grade level. Reading this kind of stuff is, is, uh, requires much higher level reading ability than that. Uh, but you can't just walk into college without having had a personal history of reading from easy books up. You know, so it's, you, you have to start off with the B book, you know, Big B, Big Brown Bear. Big, big brown bear, blue bull. Big brown bear, blue bull, beautiful baboon. Anybody read that book? Big brown, brown bear, blue, blue bull, beautiful baboon, blowing bubbles. Big brown bear, blue bull, beautiful baboon, blowing bubbles, bump. Black bugs, banana boxes. That's, right? You, you get, it's the, it's you know one of the B books. You know, it's the kind of thing parents read to their kids. You know, and you have to put emphasis on the syllables, you know, so that they get a kick out of it and they laugh, you know, and all that kind of, you know, you know, and the kids, you know, and then they graduate to the next level of reading. Of course, eventually they start reading on their own. It's absolutely gorgeous to see this, you know, a little, little you know, kindergartner reading a book, you know, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, but of course it happens, right? Well, those are the kids now that are going to have the vocabulary, the ability uh, to read on their own. They're enthusiastic about reading because they've come to love books and so on. And on they go, right? Now they're off on their own and they're going to be uh, continuously reading. You take them to the library or they want to get their own books. You can buy them books for Christmas and birthdays and things of that sort. And they, they begin uh, collecting their own books, have their own bookshelves. When they go to bed at night, they sit in bed with a book until they fall asleep. You know, they get up in the morning, they might be reading the newspaper along with the parents, who knows, right? You know, they, all that kind of reading takes place. But and then by the time they get to college, they have the motor skills, the neural skills to be able to sit there for a long time, a long time reading difficult material. And of course you're, you, you then progress. You get to the point where you can read chemical abstracts, <laughs> which
which are, take my word for it, they're incredibly boring unless you've prepared yourself for that. You know, that's, so, so, you may, uh, I, by the way, that was odd, but I found in one of the abstracts in the library, it was chemical abstracts, I found somebody had left their, their Alaska driver's license in the book. So I turned it in, but that was pretty weird, you know, that somebody left their driver's license in one of the chemical abstracts. Mm -hmm. Your reason why they would drive it. <sighs> I don't think so. Because uh, those books, I don't know, if, you know they're, they're, they won't, the, the steering wheels, I'm sure, are made for a certain size book. Because uh, if you've ever driven on the East Coast, you realize that having a book on your steering wheel is absolutely mandatory because uh, otherwise you're bored to death sitting there and you'll fall asleep. Uh, but if you have a good book, you know, and you, every once in a while you look up to see if the traffic has moved, you know, you know that's a great way to read a novel actually. But it has, has to be small enough. Uh, the Harry Potter books, hardbacks, won't fit on the steering wheel. It depends on the steering wheel. Too. But these kids are going to grow up to be uber mentioned. What's an Ubermensch? Besides, of course, in German, it just means an overman or a superman. But what does Nietzsche mean by an Ubermensch? You've heard the expression, right? Not. How come we don't say that? Or have you ever been uh, someone heard someone call someone else a Nietzschean? Who is Nietzsche? Let's go find. I really had hoped that you got to see the video that I posted on the link. And I'm I'm horrified that this morning it won't pull up. Last night it did, because I rewatched it. And that was great. <laughs> Sorry about that. I probably screwed it up for you by being so thrilled. I actually posted it on Facebook, and that, that probably is what triggered it being removed. <sighs> Never do that again. Right. Um, so, born in Rocken which is in northern Germany. It's a Lutheran stronghold. His father was a Lutheran minister, but died when he was a young boy. And it was a miserable, uh, uh, prolonged death because uh, his father died of some sort of brain disease when he actually did die. Uh, they discovered that like a quarter of his brain or something was, was missing. Uh, so whatever disease he had or whatever illness he had, um, basically uh, took his brain away from him. Um, yet, uh, earlier on in his childhood, he was raised as the son of a minister in the parish house, and they, that church is still there, uh, etc. So in the video, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's BBC, uh, uh, Bethany actually sits there at the house and goes into the little church and so on talks about how impressed he was that as a child, uh, one of the most significant events for him was hearing the Alleluia course uh, from the Messiah and uh, just wanting to be one of the angels and sing along with the others. Um, uh, of course, as his father suffers and loses his first his eyesight and then his mind uh, and then suffers and dies, uh, it's a shock. Yet he still went on to study in a seminary, uh, or what would eventually uh, make him a minister himself. But while he was there, uh, he began studying books that talked about biblical criticism, uh, that treated the Bible as a human written book, and questioned a lot of the sources, arguing that they weren't necessarily historical, etc. Right? Um, that put his faith into question and got him and his sister upset and his mother mad at him and so on and so forth. But eventually he went on then to study 
philosophy, and he became interested in Schopenhauer. And remember, Schopenhauer was very negative. He was an atheist himself, argued that there was no meaning in life, uh, and that life basically sucks, and that, uh, you know, I, I said that it was entropy, uh, you know, that, that entropy is waiting, uh, you know, constantly to screw things up. You know, your car will break down eventually. Uh, you know, the uh, you know, best intentions always you know, have something go wrong with them, etc. Uh, um, so he ends up being influenced by Schopenhauer and thinks uh, in much the same way. There was a diff difference uh, between them. They both appreciated art as being the sort of thing that could give meaning to life. And by the way, uh, while Schopenhauer influenced Wagner, Wagner influenced Nietzsche until they had a breakup over basically anti-Semitism seems to be the, the big problem. Although Bettany points out that it was really that Wagner seemed just so ego maniacal, so full of himself, so thrilled with his uh, um, star character. You know, he was, he was kind of like the rock star in Germany at that time. Uh, so, um, hours long. They're a measure. They're rounding down, I think. I think if you round up, it's 16 hours. I mean, there was a whole, it's still incredibly popular, but he built uh, the Bayreuth Theater uh, for the, specifically for his ring cycle to be performed. Uh, um, and he was like outstanding in developing all the new special effects and all, you know, it was just amazing, and so, but it was the status quo that actually showed up to enjoy it. So all the people that had the money and, and could basically buy the tickets came and were absolutely thrilled with it. And Nietzsche was there, and yet Nietzsche was horrified because instead of being a revolutionary who was going to totally transform art and make art the source of meaning in life <laughs> instead of religion, Wagner instead was just being part of the upper class elite who took advantage of the people that were the herd as far as Nietzsche was concerned, right? What he was thinking in terms of was Darwinian evolution, although in some respects he disagreed with Darwin. Uh, Darwin talks mostly about uh, survival of the species, you know, you know, can a particular species adapt to its environment? And if so, then it, it survives. You know, so for Darwin, the real uh, secret uh, uh, to uh, being the dominant species was survival. And Nietzsche was not interested in survival. He was interested in fantastic achievements as opposed to just mere survival. So what he was trying to do was create an ubermensch that was literally above the common human being. Everyone else was just merely human. So if you've ever heard that expression, the merely human, right? The herd, referred to them as a herd of sheep, basically. Uh, and by the way, was horrified at Christianity. So remember when he had that that change of heart, he ended up rebelling against Christianity and he thought that Christianity taught people primarily to put up with entropy, put up with how miserable life was, uh, and 
Expect instead, by suffering and allowing your life to continue uh, to be suffering, uh, uh, and of course that's not the comfy chair. That was the joke, part of the joke in that, right? Most people's lives are miserable, right? But if you put up with it and you realize that this is the kind of suffering that Christians should, uh, you know, just basically, uh, you know, allow uh, to happen and not even try to change it, that eventually your soul will be released and go to heaven where you will be absolutely uh, um, in paradise, right? Uh, so, so for Nietzsche, what Christianity teaches people is to be losers, right? Not want to change or benefit themselves uh, by competing and getting better, right? You know, instead, it's just putting up with the status quo, let the status quo have all the money, etc., and you guys just suffer. Uh, and the more you suffer, the better off you will be in the end. After all, look at this kind of suffering that Jesus uh, had as our exemplar, right? You know, if you want to know what suffering is, look at Jesus, and boy, you know, that's your role model. Let the world crucify you, and you'll be saved, right? You know, that's totally the opposite of what uh, Nietzsche argues uh, the ubermensch should be. The ubermensch instead is, is that next evolutionary step, and it doesn't happen biologically, it happens mentally, because you're the reader that reads all the books, and you're the one that not only can do all the hard stuff, but you're also the person who writes the hard stuff, and comes up with the next evolutionary mental leap of mankind. And, of course, Nietzsche is thinking of himself in this. He's egocentric himself. Maybe one of the reasons he didn't like uh, uh, Wagner eventually was because he wanted Wagner to pay more atten attention to him and didn't get it. Instead, Wagner was so wrapped up in his own magnificence that he wouldn't pay attention to how wonderful Nietzsche was, right? You need, you know, everybody needs to, to slap everyone else on the back and cheer them on, right? But, which, by the way, is why you guys are all such excellent students, as far as I'm concerned. You're all the best. And I wouldn't just say that. That's true. Sort of. <laughs> Has that air of truthiness. But you know you're a great student. Yeah. She, she does. You, and you're a great student. You, all, you already know everything already. When push comes to shove, you're all set. I'm a terrible teacher, too, so you're just suffering. You know. But that's probably good for you. Well, that's the old. Let me play Thus Speak Zarathustra for you. You all know this. should do is use it in 2001. <coughs> A simple flavor is now certified fresh. Critics are going wild about this delicious concoction. It's stylish and sexy. Rolling Stone says, don't miss it. It's very so nice. A simple favor rated R. Now playing. Sorry about the ads. So this is from a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the beginning. Any of you have seen it before? Great movie. A couple folks. It's actually better than usual. Usually... Never heard of it. It was from 
melody or piece. It comes from Richard Strauss's uh, tone poem, which is what he called them instead of symphonies. Um, Thus spake Zarathustra, or al also spake Zarathustra, um, which is thus spoke, however, you can say Zarathustra. And who is Zarathustra? Well, this is actually Nietzsche's book, uh, the one where he, he wrote it while in a, uh, at least two of the books out of four, he wrote in a Swiss farming uh, community up in the Alps, um, uh, which is absolutely beautiful, and you can see, you know, he's going for hikes in the mountains, and he's coming down, and so in a sense, it's almost autobiographical. And, and the Zarathustra, who's probably Zoroaster, from the, Pers the, the uh, Persian uh, religion, right, where the Magi come from. Uh, but he comes down from the hill and he's realized that God is dead. What does he mean by God is dead, by the way? You've heard, heard the expression, yes? But what does he mean by it? Anyone? The thought? Well, it's actually very biblical. Who died on the cross? Jesus. Jesus, and Jesus was... God, Son of God. Very interesting. Uh, so literally, it's a Christian belief that God dies for us. So in a sense, God is dead. He's quoting Martin Luther. He said, God is dead. And we have killed him because of our sins, right? He's died uh, uh, to rescue us uh, uh, from our sins, right? Um, so literally in the myth or the story, which by the way that's what a myth is, is a story. And no story is true, strictly speaking. Statements in stories are true or false, but a myth or a story is an interpretation of those statements. And so strictly speaking, when you're talking story, the story isn't true or false. The statements in the story can be true or false, right? But in any case, for Nietzsche, when he says God is dead, he means the reason that we have a traditional meta-narrative that gives us a sense of morals. We talk about Kant and others that say God must exist because otherwise we wouldn't have morals. Nietzsche flips that and says, well, we don't actually have morals. The reason for it is because we have killed God. We no longer need to believe in God. Because those stories are no longer believable, right? Says Nietzsche. But who's he talking to? To the people? But guess what? Everyone thinks he's a nut. What the heck are you talking about, right? You know? And he realizes, I have come too soon. Guys aren't ready for this, right? But who is he talking to? He's talking to the people that he thinks are the ubermensch, the next evolutionary step. The individuals that evolved to the point where they realize that all these traditional stories are stories, and that stories are neither true nor false. In fact, they're just made up by people. Of course, that doesn't zoom in on the problem of well, what, what about the statements in the story, right? You know, that's, that's kind of an issue, right? Um, but Nietzsche's kind of glossing over that. He's instead just pointing out that we have these traditional meta-narratives that give morality a, a basis, right? Uh, so, so if we're trying to figure out, well, you know, is abortion something that we should allow or not? Right? The, the question we were talking about when we were uh, looking at uh, the abortion argument. And what is a person, right? Well, if we're at the point where we think that it's up to us to vote on it, and that we have to decide in a democracy when you're a person and when you're not, that it's a subject of negotiation as well as like what rights ought you to have, right? You know, we're not saying these are God-given rights. They're social contract rights 
and we might decide, okay, everybody should have the right to have a Mercedes Benz. Because you need a car like that in order to get around in Anchorage, right? So it's just not fair if you don't have your own car. So it's a right. You know, if we all vote for that, you know, then the poor municipality is going to have to cough up the bucks to give everybody a Mercedes Benz, right? So if you believe that what we mean by rights, what we mean by morality, what we mean by a person, what, whether a child, a fetus, uh, should be aborted or not, should it be illegal or not, we're, today we, we vote on this. Should, should Kavanaugh be elected or appointed by the committee, the Senate committee, and be voted on by the Senate and then become a, a new Supreme Court justice, or should we be concerned about the kind of behavior that he had as a child, as a teenager, as a drunk college student? Uh, is that indicative just of him or the whole patriarchy? You know, what, what are we so mad about, right? Um, you know, are, we're voting on what's right and wrong. We're voting on whether or not we should elect or allow him to be a Supreme Court judge on whether or not, uh, and of course we've got a divided society. For the most part, you might say that there are at least two sides, maybe a third side, the intermediary side, right? But there are some who feel like a fetus uh, you know, is not a person yet and ought to be destroyed if the mother doesn't want it. It's up to her, right? On the other hand, there's others that say, but this is murder. Right? The extreme opposite side of that, right? You know, so, so what will actually be the decision? Well, Roe v. Wade was a Supreme Court decision that was essentially attempting to demonstrate a point of view that reflected our consensus. And if it changes, what we're saying is that the consensus has changed. It's like a pendulum going back and forth, right? Um, but all of that assumes that morality is up to us to decide. And can, how can we do that? Well, we can do that if we don't believe that God is there telling us what the case is. And we can feel that way if we believe that there is no real God that's telling us the way things are. Instead, it's up to us. So God, in that sense, was made up in the first place but we've destroyed the need for that story, and so therefore God is dead. That's what Nietzsche's saying, at least my interpretation, right? So he's not saying we've actually like found out where God was somehow outside of the universe, sent a secret hydrogen bomb and blew him up. No, that's totally not what we're thinking, right? Um, instead, you know, the concept of God, which was absolutely necessary throughout history, up to this point, now the ubermensch becomes God. And who's the ubermensch? You're the ubermensch. You're the ubermensch. You become the ubermensch as soon as you mentally come to realize all of these stories are just created by man, used by the authorities in order to make you the sheep. I'm the authority, I tell you what you must do. You can't wear your hat like that. You have to put it around backwards. No, I'm just, I'm just and you're like, oh, 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 okay, you know, put it around. No. <laughs> by the way, America is a great country this way because you know, when you tell somebody, you have to do it this way, what do they first do? The exact opposite, right? <laughs> Which, by the way, you could also use. You could say, never punch that dog ever again. No, that, that would do just the opposite. I, want, I wanted you not to hit the dog ever again. You should hit the dog three times a day or else I'll hit you. Oh, maybe that won't work. No, I don't, you can tell I'm not very well practiced using reverse psychology, but you get the idea. Don't do your homework, you'll get too smart. And then you'll outsmart me, and I'll have to give you a higher, whatever. Give, 
parents give you money? Yeah. They do? Yeah. And if you ask for more, do they give it to you? Yeah. <laughs> so they don't use reverse psychology on you because it it's not necessary. Is there reverse psychology? Yes. Like you don't want the money? Reverse <laughs> I don't think that would work for me. Reverse psychology is whenever, whenever, there, see, look, it, it's right there, right? It's, it's obviously. Yeah, so if they say, Shannon, you don't want the money, like, I don't think that's going to make me want the money any less. <laughs> Well, so, so, so the advantage of you're out thinking the person mm -hmm. by telling them not to do what you want them to do. And then they actually take the word. <laughs> it's like that scene in The Princess Bride with the poison and the cubs. Do you ever see it? Yes. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how that's reverse psychology. Because he's trying to tell him to drink the poison. He's like... And the other guy thinks it's reverse psychology to like drink the cups, so he ends up drinking the cup that he doesn't want him to pick, thinking it's reverse psychology. But he's like reversing the reverse psychology. Yeah, in but the end, neither not... one's poison. No, both of them are poison. Oh, oh wait, and then he That's drinks he the dies. antidote for the poison. He already had the antidote. Yeah, but that's like reverse reverse psychology. Yeah, it didn't matter which <laughs> cup he drank because they were both poison. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he fooled them into thinking that one of them was poisoned and the other one wasn't. Yes. But they both were. then they'll try to do without it. That will save you the money, actually. Although, I don't think that will work. <laughs> the whole rest of our society is convincing the child, you need the money. You know, that's the beauty of the tooth fairy. Even the tooth fairy works because, right, you lost your tooth, put it in an envelope under your pillow, and tonight the tooth fairy will come and give you money. And you're like, whoa into this. Who needs teeth? I want the money, right? Says the toddler. Yeah. Pulling out all their teeth. So, Richard Strauss writes Thus Spake Zarathustra, which is a tone poem, and you get this incredibly climactic build of the, the trumpet, uh, um, uh, that piece that you heard while the ape pre, pre hominid, what, what, well it was a hominid, but actually how many of you could tell it was a real man dressed up in an ape suit? Yeah, well remember, 1968, the special effects in the movies weren't nearly as good as they are today. Uh, where you can have you know someone dressed like Chewbacca and everyone thinks that, that Wookiees really exist, don't, don't you? No. Maybe. Okay. But, well, obviously that was hilarious to some extent. But the point of the movie, the point of uh, why Thus Big Zarathustra's melody, the opening melody is played, is actually a, a long piece, and that's just part of it. The motif, though, from it is bum, 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 bum. Right, you get the, the whole piece, right? Um, is the hominid is learning tools, right? That's pretty obvious. You know, he's just dropping it and then, this is cool, man. On goes, you know, and then he, and then it transfers to actually killing animals, you know, as you see, he crushes the skull, and then he's got the animals lying down, et cetera. Oh. Anyway, I, I don't know if any animals were harmed in the making of that movie, because that was before PETA got involved in that sort of thing. Uh, and 
they had to feed the crew. So who knows? I know, like, it grows. I know, like Apocalypse Snow, they killed a cow in front of it. What did they? Yeah. I can't remember that part. Yeah, isn't that is when they got to the temple with the oh, um, it, lieutenant? Oh, the lieutenant. Yeah. And, and he then, kills the colonel. Horrible movie, by the way. I disagree. But it was made to be horrible to convince people that the whole war effort was horrible. So it's anti-war propaganda. That's why it's horrible. But it's not. Yeah, I actually agree with you. But that's a different meaning of how horrible it was. But um, I remember being horrified because at the time I was pro-Vietnam War. I voted for Nixon. Can you forgive me? Well, it's kind of interesting too. You have to withdraw from the class, you know. Hey, you forgive people, right? That's a Christian, you know. Actually, Nietzsche would hate that. You know, you shouldn't forgive people. You should kill them. <laughs> no, actually. Nietzsche probably would. Now that's, if you did watch the Bettany News piece, early on where she shows Hitler photographed standing admiring the bust of Nietzsche in the Nietzsche archives. Right, that's kind of a famous picture. We, even though we couldn't. Nietzsche, uh, Hitler on the one side. Uh, notice the mustache. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> on both of them, actually. Kind of interesting too. By the way, the the reason for this shaped mustache in the military is because if you're uh, um, going to put on a gas mask and you're going to get a good seal on the mask. You can't have the mustache coming out over where the seal has to be, because otherwise the hair will break the seal. It's just true. It was true even when I was in the military. When I had a mustache, you had to have that seal. You know, it had to. So there were regulations on facial hair and so on. I don't know what Sikhs do, right? Because they're allowed to wear turbans and full beards and everything. How does that work if they're in a gas environment and they have to have the seal on their, their, their mask? I don't know. None of you have been in the Army and have been gassed. It's one of the fun things in basic training is the CS gas tent where you get gassed so that you know what it's like. <laughs> Um, but so Hitler came and paid his respects to Nietzsche. And the book, Also Sprach Zarathustra, was a requirement if you were in the Schutzstaffel, the SS, right? Uh, you had to carry that in your pocket instead of a Neues Testament, New Testament. I, idea of this was everyone that was in the SS were supposed to be ubermensch, an ubermensch, ubermen. Uh, so, so Hitler basically was assuming that the leadership of the Reich, including the, the, the SS, were all ubermensch. They've evolved to be that next step. In other words, he's fond enough not only of the will to power, which remember that comes from, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the triumph of the will, or the will, uh, that's Schopenhauer, but the will to power is Nietzsche, right? Uh, so, so as far as, uh, there's an overlap here, you know, when we talk about the, the uh, triumph of the will, that movie, uh, that's 
playing to Nietzsche as well, right? Uh, as well as Schopenhauer. And so clearly, Hitler was impressed, one way or the other, right? Um, by both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. Probably Nietzsche more than Schopenhauer, right? Um, but the Nazis would have been interested in both of them. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and we also know that Nietzsche's sister, let me find a picture of her. Here's Nietzsche's sister handing Hitler Nietzsche's walking cane. That's pretty impressive. I'm curious what happened to that, where, where Hitler took it. Um, but that's the sister. So she's kind of passing on the token to Hitler. And the understanding is that um, when Nietzsche died, he left his notebooks and things uh, for the book, The Will to Power, incomplete. And she edited how many? That's a hard word. She changed it. She put it together. She edited it. Everybody say edited it without all the extra did 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 okay, sorry. And did did, there you go. Just have to put the emphasis on the right syllable, right? So, she deliberately made his work fit the Nazi ideology, the fascist ideology. But Bettany, in her production, and others, by the way, it's not just Bettany, this is really kind of the way the uh, academic world treats Nietzsche this way. Not everyone, it's an argument, will argue that Nietzsche absolutely would abhor anti-Semitism, which by the way is an important part of the Nazi uh, fascist set of, of ideas, right? And it's not just that, by the way, if you apply social Darwin Darwinism, have you ever heard of that, social Darwinism? So this theory that individuals, groups, and people, thank goodness, who gave us this? Is this uh, oh, some? Dictionary out there. Not urbandictionary.com? <laughs> the theory that individuals, groups, and peoples are subject to the same Darwinian laws of natural selection as plants and animals. And what? Does it sound like that's largely discredited? It isn't, is it? If we're going to be honest, there's a lot of people that still believe that it's true. Social Darwinism was advocated by Herbert Spencer, British philosopher, and others in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and was used to justify political conservatism, imperialism, and racism, and to discourage intervention and reform. By the way, if we trace it back, I think an earlier precursor to that would be um, of Malthusianism or Malthus, Malth if you're a Malthusian, uh, you believe that, um, well, basically entropy works for society at large. So if uh, what Malthus, Reverend Thomas Malthus argued uh, was that the number of children that humans have increases what's the right word, algebraically, I guess, right? Uh, whereas the amount of food that we could produce increases only in kind of a straight line, right? Uh, so that 
every so often, there will be way more people than the amount of food can support. And once that happens, you will have, as nature will do this, you will either have famine, or you will have uh, plagues, or you will have wars. One way or another, that population is going to be cut back. And it's just nature. That's the way nature does it. By the way, Malthus is before Darwin and was one of the ones that influenced Darwin to think this way. It's kind of interesting too, right? Um, notice he dies 1834. Remember, Darwin writes the uh, origin of the species in 59, 1859, right? So he influences Darwin and others, Herbert Spencer. Uh, and the social Darwinism thing then is that, well, just as individuals compete in an environment, so do societies, so do groups of people compete. Heck, wars, obviously, right? Uh, so different groups will fight different, one, different groups and so on. And throughout history, by the way, this has always been the case. Yes? So that's pretty, pretty agreed upon. Um, does it still happen? Thinking Rohingya familiar with what's going on in Asia right now with the Rohingya. So basically they're being wiped out. believe seems absolutely the case actually groups of people still try to now if you're a globalist or you believe in globalism or you believe in uh, um, diversity is good and, and by the way that's a, a religious tenet of being an American too I would argue uh, that we recognize that uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, tools will help you find the right tool for the job. Right? So you know, if you're a, a, a car repair shop and all you have are tools for American cars and someone pulls in with a, pu a Puget, you know, the funny little French car. Who would buy a French car? <laughs> but you get the idea. You know, that some people do buy Pugets. And of course, if you do, you need to fix it. Same thing with a porch. If you have a, you know, you buy a porch. I'm just kidding. I know how to pronounce Porsche. What about Puget? And I know how to say Peugeot. <laughs> I do. Sorry. I have an Audi, which I have to learn how to pronounce that too. How about this car? It's an, what, is, what is it? It's an Audi. Have one of those. By the way, once you get in one of those cars and you turn it on, you realize you've never driven a real car before. That's just amazing. That's just true. So the same thing was same thing with steak. You know, if you've only eaten steak at Denny's, <laughs> and then you go to like you know the long or in a restaurant or something, you know, or actually the officers club in San Angelo, ooh, they were fantastic as I recall. But then your son gives you a hundred dollars off thingy at Sullivan's downtown. And you go to Sullivan's and you figure, hey, a hundred dollars, two of us should be able to eat for fine. You know, you know, wrong. You actually still owe $25 at least for the tip, right? So good. However, they give you a steak, and you look at it and you think, man, that's only like a third the size of steak that I would get at Denny's. 
But then you take one bite of that steak and you realize you have never eaten real steak before. What is this? This is, you, I know you called it a steak, but I put it in my mouth and my mouth started being like, you know, the dog that gets a dog biscuit. Remember that when you were a kid? No? So far, no one's done that. And said, in, on second thought, now that you've talked about whatever, but we look at test two. Okay, I don't ask what's an Uber name. So for the quiz question, How do you like being considered an Ubermensch? How do you like being considered an Ubermensch? Because according to Nietzsche, you are. You've evolved mentally. It doesn't mean that you are a Nietzschean like in some of those space fiction, science fiction movies, you know, where they're all huge brutes, you know, etc. You know, there's some some movies that depict they're Nietzsche and they're like gods, you know, they're, you know, they're almost immortal and they're, they're physically humongous, etc. I don't mean that. And, I, and Nietzsche didn't either. Remember, if Nietzsche's thinking about himself, he clearly wasn't humongous, he clearly wasn't uh, uh, sports-like uh, and so on. Um, he was always ill, actually. Uh, but he certainly thought of himself as a genius. And by the way, he was treated that way. Um, got his uh, first professorship when he was in early, his early 20s. It was a record. Would have been beaten by Leibniz if Leibniz had decided to teach, but he didn't. He didn't want any parts of the university once he graduated. But Nietzsche thought that would be absolutely wonderful, started teaching in Basel, uh, uh, Switzerland, but after a while uh, came to realize that it was absolutely horrific. That, there was, that was not, you know, and, and that most of his students were not the audience that he was hoping they would be. That most people do not become Ubermensch. There's only a few people that do, like Lou Salome, for example. Um,
afternoon. Friday afternoon, same time. That's Nietzsche. Good night. Uh, it's a horrible movie, actually, it's called When Nietzsche Wept. It's about Professor Brewer and his relationship with Nietzsche, which is fiction. Because Brewer did not have a relationship with Nietzsche, as far as I know, historically. Uh, but this is um, a movie that depicts Nietzsche as needing psychological help and going to Professor Brewer, who is a psychiatrist, one of the early ones. Uh, in fact, one of his students is Ziggy, who everyone knows is Sigmund Freud, right? Ziggy. to do things for yourself. Doesn't that deprive men the pleasure of serving you? We both know that some of the services we provide are not necessarily good for them. The habits of a lifetime are... So she is a friend of, she's a student of Nietzsche, and she realizes Nietzsche is going bonkers, and she wants to find help for Nietzsche, for Nietzsche, so she comes to recruit Dr. Brewer and encourages him to treat Nietzsche, but of course you can't tell Nietzsche that you're treating him because Nietzsche's a genius and thinks he's smarter than everybody else, and so you have to be smarter than Nietzsche in getting him to come to you for help. And so what he does is he goes to Nietzsche and asks Nietzsche to help him. Reverse psychology almost, right? Yeah, so you get the idea. So, so the movie is all about kind of the two of them trying to help one another. So it gives you a sense of both philosophy and how the talking cure developed. Uh, and you get to see Ziggy as a young man too, which is kind of cool. Um, but I still, so I did ask a quiz question. What, how do you feel about being thought of as an Ubermensch? You might feel like, wow, that's horrific because that sounds like it makes me a Nazi or an SS. Which you know, could get you arrested in most countries today, uh, especially in North Carolina. Uh, maybe not. That's not a country either. That's part of a country. But is that funny? No. I don't think so. Probably not funny. Uh, how many of you have been to North Carolina? You've seen like the Fayetteville town center where they still have a monument to slavery. It's the the place where the slaves were auctioned off. It's still there with signs explaining and the chains all still there, shiny, so that if they need to, they could still use them again. Talk about social Darwinism, right? Fun. Interesting. Um, it's actually an American idea. Even though Herbert Spencer's involved, it was Americans that primarily put it into effect, and Hitler got his ideas from what was going on in the U.S. I remember our, our uh, migration laws were aimed at making sure that most of the people that came to the United States were coming from Northern Europe want them coming from southern Europe or other places. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe not. By the way, if you've ever been into a, a, a restroom, 
that had someone paint or scratch onto the stall, God is dead, Nietzsche. You ever seen that? Well, and then underneath it, it says, Nietzsche is dead, God. That's actually true, right? Because God is still with us, and Nietzsche is kaput. Gans gegangen. Aus D-A-O, right? Aus D-A-O, that means out of the area of operation. <coughs> we used to say that a lot. Okay, any questions for me? You guys going to have fun the rest of the week? You're leaving, yes? Yeah, so I guess. <laughs> Are you going to eat any peaches while you're gone? I don't like peaches. You're going to the wrong place. I know. I can't say that there. I'll probably get You're going to the wrong place. Actually, it's going to be on the internet, so it's already... Is it? Oh, the video? <laughs> the people of Georgia can see that I hate people.